everybody. Welcome. My name is Gregory Parks, and you are watching Conlink on CVG TV. Our next guest is an author known for her Devil's West novels, the Vine Art Trilogy, and Cosa Nostradamus. Please welcome Laura Ann Gilman. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. So um, you uh, did not start out as a writer, although your bio said that you came from a family of writers. So what was that like growing up with at being part of a writer family? Um, like any other family, but a little weirder, possibly. My mother is a short, was a short story writer, uh, more on the literary side of things. Uh, my, I had a great uncle who wrote for the stage. My uncle was an editor um, in, in the uh, New York book, pub, book industry for many, many decades. Um, so I think really the, the main difference for me was that a lot of people say, you know, I wanted to be a writer, but I was told it wouldn't, wouldn't be possible, or I was told it was a stupid thing, or I was told I would never make it and didn't get any support. From the, from the get-go, I had support. My, my mother and my father both encouraged me more in the sense of, well, this is what she's going to do, so we might as well encourage her kind of thing. Um, but it was also very much, uh, this is a job. When you do this, the moment you go professional, these are the expectations. My uncle was um, both immensely helpful and immensely dispiriting in a good way. Again, this is a business. This is, it is not going to be because you're a fabulous writer only. It's not going to be because you're a nice person. It is going to be a whole bunch of things, including a lot of luck. You have to be prepared, which is probably why uh, I didn't actually send anything out until uh, my late 20s, because I had this sense of, I need to be ready. Uh, I can't jump the gun any. So I was an editor first, up as the uh, executive editor for Rock Science Fiction which was the science fiction imprint of Penguin USA at the time, and had a blast. I loved it, but I also learned a lot about writing from editing. So I think the two really were, for me, two halves of the same whole. Uh, they, they work together beautifully. I don't think I would have been the editor I was without also being a writer, and I know I wouldn't be the writer I am without having been an editor. So it's all, I guess, preparation for the end result that preparation that your family was talking about. Mm -hmm. so, um, and the steady paycheck. <laughs> yes, and the steady paycheck. So what sort of things did you learn from editing that, have, that you found have helped you in your writing? And what sort of things would you, would you uh, offer to others who want to be a writer um, by the way of recommendation One of the things or wisdom? One of the things I learned from editing uh, is all the different ways there are to approach your voice. There very much isn't one single way to write a book. You could have five different writers, they would write the same story and it would be completely different books because of the way they approach it. Not just it, in every single choice that they make, um, it's different. And as an editor, your job is not to shape those things but to help the author shape those things. And to do that, you have to be aware of what they're doing, even if they're not. And a lot of times when we're writing, we're not sure why are we making these choices? We just make them because it feels right. But we're in the flow of the story. As an editor, I had to sit back and go, why did they do that? Uh, what, what purpose did it serve? Would something else work better if I suggest it? Uh, what does the whole picture look like that that choice leads to? And you're very analytical when you're writing, when you're editing, which you aren't always when you're writing. Anyone who wanted to be a writer, honestly, the, the the advice that I got from my mom very early on, it's a business. Even more so now with so many people self-publishing, you can't just write a story and throw, well, you can write a story and just throw it on whatever platform you want. Uh, nobody's stopping you, that's kind of the problem. But if you want to be a professional, if you want to be a survivor, um, you have to take in account everything that goes into the business. And I'm, I mean, here I am, I'm preaching and I don't always follow my own advice. Uh, 
I, I forget to do a lot of things and, and stuff I know I should be doing. I'm like, oh, <laughs> but to the best that you can, you're a small business person. And the writing part is art, yes, but the art has to get sold. Uh, unless you're independently wealthy, in which case none of this applies to you. And I would like to apply for you to be my patron. Uh, but really, it's it's sitting down, uh, ass in chair, and work. And remember that the work isn't just the words. The work is everything that goes to support the words. So with part, part of that work and doing the work, um, I imagine with doing multiple projects at the same time, that augments the amount of work and the amount of that just get into the grindstone that you mentioned. So then how do you balance it with, you have these, you have two historical fantasies in the pipeline. You have another contemporary fantasy series being written on spec and the stories that you provide for your Patreon supporters. That sounds like a lot of coals in the fire. And how do you, how do you balance that? Like what is your, <laughs> what is your MO for balancing that and making sure that those balance. things get done without putting yourself out. It, I was saying before, my, my office is a disaster zone because we're in the middle of renovations and everything's been shoved in here. But if it weren't, I could show you, well, you can see some of it. Um, this is one project I'm working on and it's on that wall. Another project I'm working on, there are post-its all over the other wall. Um, and I have a notebook with some of the other things. And I basically try to keep them in separate physical spaces as well as mental spaces. Uh, that's how it works for me. I know a lot of other people like uh, Bullet Journals or uh, Scrivener, which I use, has some great software help for that. But mainly it's just, uh, for me, compartmentalizing my time. I work on a project at a time. I'm not, when I'm working on that project, I'm only working on that project. I'm not thinking about something else. Uh, and if I am, that means that something's gone wrong in both those projects. So for me, that's how I do it. It's uh, a kind of um, suburban soccer parent organization level of who's got to go where at what time and how much <laughs> gas do you have in the car. So, and sometimes you run out of gas and, and somebody misses a practice and you just, you know, say, screw this and you take your coffee and you go back to bed. Uh, but not often, she said hurriedly in case her editor is watching. <laughs> <laughs> and um, speaking of like flow um, and hopping around, um, especially not only from genre, but uh, media, have you ever considered any of your works being adapted? Or if someone were to approach you, is that something you would consider? Or are you, 100% satisfied with them just being, your work's just remaining uh, printed media. I think if any writer says they're not interested in adaptions, they're lying through their teeth. Uh, no, I, there are a couple of my projects I would absolutely love to see um, either for screen or graphic novel. I think that they're just beautifully um, appropriate for that. Um, I've always, wished for that the retriever series could have gotten its own mini series because it is very much in that that feel uh and the special effects would have been very easy to do these days um i've been approached a couple of times nothing's ever come of it which is kind of the the song of the writer hollywood called and then they hung up uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you uh you keep hoping you keep waiting um Mainly you just keep hoping and you keep writing because we really, for the most part, writers have no influence whatsoever uh, unless we're also indie filmmakers or have besties yeah. in Hollywood and not even then. It's just, you wait. I mean, it, would I love to see The Devil's West as a big screen movie? Oh my God, yes, I know exactly who they should cast. Nobody ever asked the writer. <laughs> and writers do get asked this a lot, but 
do you have any favorites among the characters or the worlds that you have written? And if so, who are some of them? Uh, Danny Hendrickson. Danny uh, showed up as a walk-on character in the uh, paranorm Paranormal Scene Investigations books. And in the Retriever series, he's just somebody who's mentioned and in those, and he has like one or two scenes. And in those scenes, he is presented as being this really smart, with it, uh, experienced former cop turned PI who also happens to be half uh, supernatural. He's, his father was a fawn, his mother was a, a naval officer. And a while in, I thought, Danny needs his own story. I want to know more about this character. He's fun. I think I want to. And it turns out that rather than being this competent together, Danny is a hot mess. Uh, second guesses himself, has serious doubts, um, is delightful as, as a person, um, and, and is competent, but he's still a hot mess. And being, I wrote uh, four novellas featuring him, um, Sylvan Investigations, they're called. And it was so much fun writing him because he is the quintessential New Yorker uh, who have also just happens to not be human. And his relationships with people were so much fun to write. So since that, over these years of writing, what do you find most rewarding about the work that you're doing? That question has two answers. Um, the first part is the most rewarding moment is when I can feel the story click into place. When it goes from being this idea that I have and an outline and some notes to a living creature. And there's always a point, and I, I can never say when it's gonna happen, but there's always a point when I'm writing when I use, I've, I've used the description a few times before, it's like when you're working um, a clay on a potter's wheel and that instant when it goes from a lump of clay to a pot and when you're watching, you can see that happen. It's, it's just, it's one turn of the wheel and suddenly everything is different. And writing is for me is a lot like that. You've got this moment of, okay, it just, it just, came alive. It just became a story. And for me, that's incredibly rewarding. It's kind of what keeps me going um, because any day it could be that the day that it happens. So, and sometimes it can happen twice in a book. You know, you're like, you're writing along, you're like, I know it's going. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, wow. Oh my God, I wasn't expecting that. Okay, let's go. The second part is when I get feedback uh, from readers, I've had some fan mail over the years uh, where people have told me that they understand the world a little bit better because of something I wrote, or they understand themselves or somebody in their lives a little bit better, that they've, they've looked at something a different way, or they've, they've understood something that confused them before. I got a letter once from a woman in the South who said that uh, she had been, she'd go to New York City on business and all of her friends were like, oh my God, you know, New York, it's really scary and da-da. And she goes, and everybody was so nice and so polite and, and I came back and nobody would believe me. And she says, and then there was this one scene in, in one of your books, I talk about being on the subway and how uh, ignoring people isn't rudeness. It's allowing them their their illusion of privacy so that everybody can be crunched shoulder to shoulder and not feel like they're being rude. Uh, and she's like, and yes, that was it. And I understood. And I can show people now and say this, this is it. And I kind of floated for an entire day on that because yes, that's exactly what it is. And I communicated that to somebody and they had had their moment of click. And that is, there's no feeling like that. Um, 
I guess it's, it's a lot like you know, teachers would feel, but I'm doing it at a distance of miles and sometimes years. And it's rare that I get to hear about it. So when I do, that's an amazing moment. Oh, marvelous. That does sound really, yeah, supremely rewarding. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us, Laura Ann. And I have, I'm afraid we have to wrap it up, but we will see more of you at the Convergence Convention coming up. Thank you for taking some time to speak with us today. We appreciate it. That's my pleasure. Beautiful. So we will see you at Convergence. And thank you for joining us here yes. for ConLink at CBGTV. Bye, everybody.